It's the year 2323, and humanity is at the end of its rope. After centuries of planetary devastation, after transforming the surface of the Earth to the point of being utterly unrecognizable, after saying goodbye to the last plants and animals and mining the last few resources that this planet had to offer, it's finally time. Stark in skyscrapers on a concrete rendition of what used to be Antarctica, civilization watches as sands that once belonged to the Sahara, the Gobi, and the Mojave overtake the last few bits of green that remains, and we realize it's time to go. The spaceships are ready, they've been ready. And though the people of Earth spent decades clinging to any false bit of hope that was left, even the most optimistic among us have finally conceded defeat. Where we go next, what we do next, is unclear. But one way or another, humanity will have to find a new home among the stars. And that's home. Well, it very well may be a solar system uh, we already know today. Meet the Trappist system, a series of seven known exoplanets orbiting around Trappist-1, a cool red dwarf star just a little larger than Jupiter. It's not too far, only 40 light years or so close enough that we can arrive within just a few generations. But even better, the Trappist system hosts not one, not two, not three, but four planets orbiting just perfectly in the habitable zone of their star. Meaning that if we can make it there against all odds in this hypothetical cosmic pilgrimage, then we just might find somewhere worth living. A humble star located in the Aquarius constellation, Trappist-1 isn't much to look at. It's a red dwarf star, the most common sort of star in the Milky Way way and the blitless coolest sort of star as well on what's called the main sequence that is what we call normal stars. It's so cool, in fact, that matter is believed to condense in the upper layers of its photosphere, a place where most stars would be more than able to vaporize almost any form of matter. It's about a tenth as massive as the Sun, with a radius so small that it barely beats out the planet Jupiter, just barely above the threshold for nuclear fusion to take place. It doesn't have any binary companion, it doesn't seem to have much of a stellar cycle, and it's expected to shine for a lifespan of about 10 trillion years, of which it's believed to have already lived through about 7,000. But the fact that Trappist-1 doesn't stand out in any particular way isn't necessarily a bad thing. Growing up in a small, quiet town in the middle of nowhere is perhaps not very much fun, but it'll probably get you to adulthood safe and sound, and so too is the case for the objects that orbit the Trappist-1 star, particularly its family of seven planets. Given the catchy names Trappist-1b, 1c, 1d, 1e, 1f, 1g, and 1h, in alphabetical order from the nearest to the furthest, these seven exoplanets are something extraordinary. If they orbited a sun like ours, all all seven Trappist planets would be fiery hellscapes orbiting much closer to their host star than Mercury is to ours. But in this solar system's case, Trappist-1's lukewarm glow is actually a massive plus. Situated so close to the star, none of the system's seven planets are left out in the same sort of cold as Uranus or Neptune, and none are getting cooked like Mercury. Or Venus. In fact, four of them, 1D, 1E, 1F, and 1G, lie in what earthly scientists have deemed to be Trappist-1's habitable zone. That is to say, if the solar system functions like we think it does, the surface temperature of each of these worlds should be such that they can host liquid water, and as such, they become hypothetically hospitable to life. All seven planets in the Trappist system are believed to be rocky, with a size anywhere between three quarters and a little bit over 110% of Earth's. They're a bit less dense than Earth is, which might imply a higher saturation of volatile chemicals chemicals, but might also indicate that they've simply just got smaller cores than Earth does, or, or cores made with less of a high iron saturation than Earth does. At least, in a hypothetical sense. It's entirely possible that any of the planets could have thick atmospheres, or an abundance of water, either frozen on the outer planets, or, or liquids on the ones in the habitable zone. It's impossible to say just how much might be there, and until our telescopes get a whole lot better than they currently are, it'll be hard to get a truly reliable estimate. But at least in theory, we might be talking about a planet with vast oceans like those on Earth. Those oceans uh, would feature some pretty insane tides, making it difficult for land-based life to develop on any coastal areas, but churning the waters well enough that nutrients and oxygen would likely be in abundance in the oceans themselves. Each planet is tidally locked to its host star, giving it a consistent light side and consistent dark side. But they also interact gravitationally with each other in a stable resonance that involves each planet tugging on the next closest as it passes by, and then being tugged back in the other direction by the planet on the opposite side. Although such a phenomenon is rare in a stable star system, Trappist appears to host a planetary system in fine balance. On a couple of the planets, 1D, 1E, and 1F, their interactions with their neighbors may cause the worlds to rotate from time to time, with a full rotation taking about as long as it would take for a few years to go by on Earth. 
But far from preventing these planets from hosting life, it's possible that it might actually make these planets more habitable, with a slow spin allowing the planetary atmosphere to reach a degree of equilibrium rather than scorching the planet on one side and freezing it on the other. And not only that, but for planets so proximally near to each other, it's possible that microorganisms from one world could relatively easily arrive at another in the event of an ejection in which those microorganisms spend their journey encased in rock. These planets' gravitational interactions may lead to a relatively high frequency of volcanic activity, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Geothermal activity is vital for the processes that are believed to have started life here on planet Earth around deep sea hydrothermal vents. So too might it trigger the activity of plate tectonic, or otherwise for pseudo-tectonic activity like occasional ruptures in the crust. Natural disasters for any hypothetical situation, but a factor that generally makes life somewhat more likely to occur. The planet's tidal heating should also lead to a progress of degassing in which dissolved gases more easily travel out of liquids, meaning that they're more likely to form an atmosphere around each planet's surface. Taken in order, TRAPPIST-1b and TRAPPIST-1c could both be magma world. Lashed by trappist one stellar winds, or at the very least, they're believed to be far too hot for liquid water. If they do have any atmosphere, it likely resembles that of the planet Venus, with a runaway greenhouse effect. TRAPPIST-1d, though, is somewhat more interesting. It may have a similar greenhouse effect, or it could be uncomfortably warm, but technically a livable version of an Earth-like watery planet, albeit one where you'd hardly have to sneeze on the water in order to get it to boil. TRAPPIST-1e shows the highest potential of all to have kept its water, and it's exactly the point in the habitable zone where it would be able to sustain liquid water in several climates, with the potential to have kept similar amounts of water as would fill multiple Earth oceans and enough carbon dioxide to keep the atmosphere warm enough planet-wide to have at least some of it be melted. And then there's TRAPPIST-1f, which is likely to be a so-called snowball planet if it doesn't have much of an atmosphere, although under-ice oceans like those on the Moon and Enceladus could still be feasible. If it does have enough CO2 to warm the planetary surface, though, it could well be an ocean planet, with some evidence suggesting that as much as half of the planetary mass could be made of water. TRAPPIST-1g has similar potential, more likely to be a snowball, but still with potential to have massive surface oceans, while TRAPPIST-1 1h, the furthest planet out, and its least massive, is believed to be either a snowball or have an atmosphere of nitrogen and methane that would make it similar to the moon of Titan. Even this last and furthest of planets, though, could well have enough water to fill several of Earth's oceans by itself. The solar system these planets live in is remarkably devoid of threats, at least so far as we can tell. Studies of the Trappist system have found no evidence of a structure similar to our solar system's Kuiper belt, filled with asteroids that occasionally travel in our direction and no evidence of comets. The orbit of all seven planets are remarkably circular, and they're highly consistent, and they're all situated in almost exactly the same plane of orbit, making their system the flattest in NASA's archives. Because TRAPPIST-1 emits mostly infrared light, it's likely that the planets of its solar system live in something resembling an eternal sunset, immersed in an orange-red glow just a bit brighter than a night lit up by a full moon. And in a touch reminiscent of the more fanciful science fiction imagery, every planet of the solar system can be seen from the surface of all the others, hanging low in the sky, larger than the moon does here on Earth. And vibrant seas crammed full with life, a temperate environment similar to some of the most comfortable parts of our planet. The first announcement of TRAPPIST-1's existence came in the year 2000, when astronomer John Gysis and his research team revealed its presence after they ran a survey of ultra-cool dwarf stars that were near to Earth a year prior. The name TRAPPIST is reference to the TRAPPIST telescope that found the star, while its planetary companions were identified in 2016 by a research team in Belgium. The planet's existence have since been verified, and so too have their orbits corroborated by a range of telescopes and observatories around the world. Since then, the planet has been a frequent target of study and public wonder, even receiving a fictionalized Taurus poster from NASA, voted Best Hab Zone Vacation within 15 parsecs of Earth. The system was also the site of an April Fool's prank played by an observatory in Namibia who claims that they'd received an SOS signal from the Trappist planets. So too did they elicit massive global attention from the public and the media, including giving the NASA website its most visible a day ever. The scientific community, though, took a somewhat different approach, setting their sights on the Trappist system for all manner of assessment in service of the greatest of questions. Can it support life? In all the Milky Way, the Trappist system's exoplanets are the most easily accessible planets to study the potential for extraterrestrial life beyond our solar system, so assessing their key properties early is critically important. If they're ruled out as suitable hosts, then okay, the world takes a disappointed sigh and moves on. But if they're ruled in as candidate planets for living ecosystems, then they'd quickly rise to the top of all research targets in astronomy. The really tricky proposition in all of this
Mars is to figure out whether any of the planets might have an atmosphere. Scientists have been able to model the readings each planet might produce on known instruments and measurements, if those instruments could be used on the TRAPPIST system, but actually using them is quite difficult. As such, uh, we've got a fairly good idea of what a positive or negative indicator of atmosphere would be, and no real way to determine whether those atmospheres are actually there, or at least we don't have it yet. So too could uh, we even figure out what the planetary atmospheres are made of, but we're not quite ready to do those sorts of measurements either. As of summer 2023, the James Webb Space Telescope has been able to determine that TRAPPIST-1b is too hot to host liquid water, and TRAPPIST-1c likely does not have a thick CO2 atmosphere indicative of a Venus-like planet. But that's all we've got so far. Unfortunately for humans, the TRAPPIST system is way too far to reach with any spacecraft currently in humanity's arsenal, or, or any we expect to be able to develop within the next several decades. At best, if humans could accelerate a spacecraft to nearly the speed of light, the planets would be some 45 years of travel away by Earth time, although it would feel much, much shorter for the inhabitants on board the craft in question. But humans are a really, really long way off from being able to do even that. The good news, at least in a pragmatic sense, is that there doesn't seem to be much of a rush anyhow, as an attempt to find any technological indicators of advanced life on TRAPPIST has come up empty, meaning even if it takes people a while to figure out light speed travel, there probably won't be much that we're missing out on. Now, The fact that the TRAPPIST system could hypothetically be habitable doesn't necessarily mean that it's habitable in reality. If we take the presence of liquid water to be our first threshold to clear, we've got to understand that its presence isn't quite so simple as the planet just being a certain and temperature. Not only would water, either in ice, liquid, or vapor form, have to find its way to TRAPPIST in the first place, but its ability to stay there is impacted by a few factors. Reflectivity, to prevent it from heating so much that it might turn to vapor, the presence of an atmosphere to help hold it close to the planet, and a greenhouse effect, where a super thick atmosphere could produce the sort of inhospitable environment found on our neighboring world of Venus. At present, our understanding of the TRAPPIST planets is not nearly complete enough to assess whether they've got atmosphere at all, or whether those atmospheres can balance out enough to prevent large parts of the planet from freezing. It's not likely that any of the planets have a moon to help keep things moving. After all, with such tightly packed planets, a moon would probably be passed around between them until it either smashes into one or is ejected from the solar system in its entirety. And to make matters worse, each of the planets are close enough to their star that its corona is likely to magnetically interact with their atmospheres, potentially further disrupting any atmosphere that does form. And finally, we're talking about a solar system whose planets probably formed quickly, with minimal debris, space dust, comets, or other non-planetary objects left behind. That means that fewer impact events would have taken place on each planet after the system formed, and if we assume that some or all of their water may have had to be delivered via comet, then that's not a great sign that any planets would have gotten enough water to form any meaningfully sized surface oceans. Any water they do have would have to arrive early in the system's formation, and then weather all the potential disruptions that might have happened since. Mathematical modeling has shown that water-dominated atmospheres in the TRAPPIST system aren't particularly likely, although even those models are based on less data than earthly scientists would like to have in order to form truly accurate expectations. Granted, all this might be irrelevant if the planet's waters are concentrated on the surface or even in the subsurface oceans, but it's still worth noting that the question of whether we would find life in the TRAPPIST system isn't necessarily the same as whether humans could live our own lives there. And while the system isn't likely going to host any earthly colonies or pop-up McDonald's anytime soon, it's not inconceivable that it may be a target far in our future for the hypothetical process of terraforming. Terraforming is a process in which a planet or moon's atmosphere, surface temperature, or ecosystem could be deliberately modified and engineered to become suitable for the sorts of life that exist on Earth, a complicated process that would take technology far beyond what we currently have. But in an ideal world, it could have the potential to block cosmic radiation, form an atmosphere, pressurize and heat a planet's surface to our liking, and allow people and other earthly beings to survive even without protective equipment. Our own solar system doesn't have many options for terraforming to speak of. The best choice would probably be Mars, which would have to have all of its water unfrozen have an atmosphere built from the ground up, and also have a massive amount of water imported in order to allow things like humidity, rainfall, and oceans of any meaningful size. But if a planet were to have a few of those elements already taken care of while sitting in a much more habitable zone around its star than Mars does around the Sun, it could quickly jump to the top of the list as soon as we figure out how to reach it. With the TRAPPIST system potentially able to support life on several planets, after or even before terraforming, it could very well be the answer if Earth either loses habitability or becomes a launch point for a civilization among the stars. And that's the strange beauty of the TRAPPIST star system. In our lifetimes, we'll never see it ourselves, neither will our children or even our children's children. But give it a couple of centuries, or maybe a couple of millennia, and the TRAPPIST system may become a cradle not just for the life that could already exist there, 
but for humanity too.